to a uh, quick introduction of Professor Shahin. Uh, Errol Shahin is a faculty member in Computer Science Department of Middle East Technical University. Uh, he accepted our invitation. I'd like to thank him for accepting the invitation and giving a talk. Uh, his degrees are in all in computer science, I think. Uh, no, one of them is in electrical engineering from Bill Kent University, but the others are mostly computer science. He has a PhD from cognitive and neural systems from <laughs> University. That's even more yeah. interesting. Yeah, that's yes. good. Uh, mm -hmm. And he has undergraduate degree from uh, uh, computer engineering, uh, no, electronics engineering, Bill Kent and MS degree from uh, computer engineering. He now uh, directs the uh, the center, a new center, right? Relatively new. Right. Uh, a center for robotics and AI. In some sense, it's similar to our center, right? Mm -hmm. And they are conducting research in uh, artificial intelligence and robotics. And uh, looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for this nice introduction. Uh, sorry, I don't have all my degrees in computer science. I'm, I'm a complete, you know, mixed bag of things. So I, that means that, you know, I know a lot of things, but, you know, superficial. So uh, you will see that in my presentation as well. Uh, today, I will be talking about our work uh, within the projects of uh, Chirac and Kalpa. It's about in-being collo uh, in uh, collaborative robotic manipulators with human-robot interaction skills. Let's see. Okay. So here's the gist of the talk in case you want you decide to leave. And uh, you can see basically the vision, uh, the appearance of robotics that we have this uh, robot here, which looks extremely like human. It has really human-like things. So of course, this is one, 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 one demo. I'm pretty sure they have specified quite this. Whereas you know, the reality in robotics is like this, where the robots, you know, there are 2 million of them that are basically building stuff for us. And this is where the success comes from. This is appearance, and this is actual reality. And <clears throat> the gist of the talk is, you know, uh, with this robot, it's very easy to talk about human-robot interaction. It's all about that, but they don't do anything useful other than, you know, look good and just, you know, uh, make us fun, entertainment, whereas these guys are the actual workhorses of robotics. And I'm interested in how to build human robot interaction skills or intelligence into these guys who are actually working in the factories. And, uh, okay. So let's have a formal start. Uh, you know, we have industrial robots. These are very efficient uh, fabrication, but they are working in complete isolation and where human labor is still necessary though in these basically in the factories. Now we have this new generation of robots, which are called collaborative robots that are safe, that provide some safety guarantees, and they can work alongside uh, humans to reduce the human labor load and basically work as compliant workmates. With but these guys again, um, with their name, they have no HRI support. They build as you know open chain manipulators, and of course, well as you have seen, like we have social robots which are mainly for entertainment and interaction purposes. They are being common in healthcare, education, etc. But there are a lot of deployment issues. I've seen a lot of basically companies who build robots like this to go bust because you know they don't do much of like they don't produce as value as desired. Uh, so our vision is you know. Uh, the industrial robots, it's, uh, the idea is to have you know, efficiency high, whereas in the collaborative case, we need to have more uh, effective collaboration. And so we want to introduce HRI to improve this, whereas you know, the social ones, well, they are not machines and basically uh, for, for the social aspects, we are basically using cobots to uh, work alongside uh, factory uh, workers. Now, this is a whole new design space. It's because you know we have some things that are common, uh, but then we need to have, provide some extra uh, features into this. Now, uh, the International Federation of Robotics basically have these different requirements for uh, H HRI. Uh, let me see. Okay, so this is the case for industrial robots where we have no collaboration and humans, uh, basically the robot's workplace is typically protected by a fence. This, and now with the collaborative robots, we have now coexistence, which means that they're both the robots and the humans, they work, but they're 
workspaces uh, do not intersect. And we have a sequential collaboration as the next space where we have a shared space uh, among their risk workspaces where human can do some part of us, put it and this, the and then the uh, basically robots can then work on it. And then comes cooperation where the robot and the uh, basically humans work together uh, and then comes responsive collaboration where actually they work and the robot actually responds well to, to users need. Now, most of the collaboration as of this day uh, basically appears in this basic domain where coexistent and se sequential collaboration. Now, if you go to a factory, these are actually my own recordings from the Archidic factory, uh, which is building uh, uh, dishwashers. Now we can see two like the human workers uh, working alongside uh, uh, alongside uh, uh, cobot. Now, uh, what I want here is I want to basically focus on uh, the human, okay? Now let me just play this with the human. Just look at, you know, how the finesse that's required to install things, okay? He is doing so many things and in a very easy way. So you can see that like he's looking at other places and and uh, that this time um, he's laughing, he's looking at some guy, okay? He's laughing. So this is part of his routine that he does this, you know, maybe eight hours a day. Whereas when you look at the, uh, the uh, cobot that is working, you can see that it is doing very, you know, some, some little things like it's, it's, it's doing, you know, some certain operations, but the level of manipulation ability that the, this robot has is, is way below than this, uh, the, the, the worker. When, when I was at the factory, you know, I was confident that the, the, these robots would never basically replace these workers who are very efficient and very capable. So our basically a key observation is that you know humans are superior to cobots in manipulation tasks, and this will remain so in the near future. So uh, our goal is then we said that we, how can we develop technologies as an apprentice cobot, and hence named the hence comes the name for our projects, Chirac and Kalfa, where uh, we treat the robot cobot as an under-skilled robotic helper that can track the state of the worker, the assembly process, and hand over or stow away tools and parts for the worker. So with this, if I can have this, this robot helping him, and then instead of uh, spending 60 seconds per basically assembly, if I can reduce this, you know, to 50, uh, to 50 seconds, then that uh, corresponds to something like, you know, 15, 20% efficiency. And that is a huge number in these factories. So that's the idea that we have. So uh, we now, I would like to show you the apprentice vision. This is like a, almost a four year old video where we said, you know, we basically shot this video, uh, even when a lot of the things were uh, hand coded. And this is the vision to, that kind of guided uh, these two projects. And uh, so uh, this this is completely scripted, okay? So you can see that like, you know, one of, one of my students, he is uh, Yunus actually, he's from Northeastern and he's doing his PhD. Uh, he's building uh, an IKEA a chair and uh, basically the cobot is then basically uh, helping him uh, during a summer. So this is the vision that we want to have. As I said, this was completely scripted. And uh, as you will see that you know, there are a lot of interesting interactions that are possible. Uh, you can see a couple of things which I'll discuss in, in, in a second. You can see that you know that you can see that the robot is very attentive. It, it doesn't look like the uh, basically the same robot in, uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, we're working at the factory. So this is basically we are talking about the next level basically uh, interactions, abilities that we want to have. <clears throat> uh, built into into these uh, robots, so you can see that like you know the humans uh, and this uh, such interaction, nonverbal interaction is important because well humans will be working you know maybe eight hours a day, so they need to have some social presence. So uh, when we look at the uh, analyze this region, you can see that you know like at the beginning the cobot is waiting attentively, like by basically looking at the shared space, and then it's for you can see that. As the human basically does the assembly, the robot is not doing anything, but it is uh, actively following the assembly process uh, because whatever when, when you want to aid, you have to uh, give him the, the the proper tools at the proper time and parts, etc. And then you know, uh, sorry, like it's wait attentively, and then it hands the script right here, 
then it follows the assembly process. And when the human does something wrong, then it refuses to stow away using some nonverbal interaction. Then it takes away this uh, script driver and stow away uh, as such. So uh, within the, the these projects, we were we are studying a lot of different things, like you know how can we build human robot interaction skills with focus on nonverbal communication. And this is what I will focus on. We work on perception abilities to track the human as well as the workspace. Uh, I will talk a bit about the awareness about the assembly process. How can we have robots along this plus guarantees on safety? But as I said, uh, I, I do not have time to, to cover all the bases. So this is the uh, basic setup that we have. Like here we have it's built around the UR5 robot with a robotic uh, jaw gripper. And we have a workspace. We have the worker here. And we had basically built uh, like uh, three cameras and uh, to essentially detect the uh, workspace, uh, the workers, basically skeleton, as well as its face to uh, have a look at its gaze. Uh, and through this, then we were able to control basically the robot. Now, uh, let me focus on the human robot interaction part. Now, when we were designing human robot interaction, uh, it's uh, it's actually an art. It's an art uh, that actually the uh, Walt Disney and other animation companies have excelled at. So instead of just going uh, straight, uh, basically to try to do it by yourself, uh, we said we realized that uh, these guys had actually laid out the animation principles that would make the basically these uh, cartoon characters, which are drawn in two D, uh, come to life. And there are actually 12 different, uh, 12 uh, um, such principles. And I will just talk uh, uh, some of them that we have used. The first one is the appeal, uh, saying that like uh, the principle it is that the character should have some charisma. And then this immediate look should have the look at me appeal. And it doesn't have to be cute. Some can be bad and villains and heroes, but you know, it, it should have this you know, uh, appeal feature. And another of this principle is the second reaction, which is, you know, when we focus on things that uh, these characters do, there are some gestures that support the main action. For example, in, in this case, you can see the tail, which is not very relevant to this basically running aspect or, you know, it's, uh, it's hair at the back. Uh, but you can see that by adding these kind of, you know, uh, things, uh, basically animated uh, this uh, whole thing a lot. Or, or arcing, meaning that you know, uh, humans like when we have multiple pauses instead of having the straight lines, humans have this you know nice uh, circular thing. This you know, like our uh, arcs, and this uh, actually makes uh, the uh, uh, the characters move in much uh, uh, like you know uh, human way. Now. Uh, in a related work, there's the Uncanny Valley, uh, which actually was proposed by Mori, McDonald, and uh, Kageki, in which uh, they uh, measured the human likeness versus affinity that we have. So if you look at this affinity scale here, like if when I look at this teddy bear, uh, this toy, you know, so when we look at this, it has uh, an appeal that it is kind of like a nice to look at. And there is when we look at the industrial robot as a test, like you know, it, does, it doesn't look like a human basically like this, and we are not basically drawn to it. And if you have, for example, a humanoid robot, then you know, then it has a higher basically affinity. Now there's another aspect that we people usually kind of skip, which is the mooing. Meaning that whether an, an entity is basically still or moving actually adds quite a lot about its uh, 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 its affinity. And uh, if you have this human, it's fine. But when it's if it's moving just like you know, humans, then its affinity actually would go up. Now, uh, when you go close, this is where the uncanny valley comes from. Uh, and you can look at this robot called Sophia, and uh, I don't know how you feel about it, but you know, it looks more human, it's like very close. But when you look at it, you can see that uh, it's there's something off about it. The, the fact that maybe it's still, the fact that you know it has this different minor details. Uh, I mean, human uh, perception is so basically fine-tuned to basically uh, to uh, perceiving humans that, you know, even minor things can basically be very distractive. So in this uncanny valley, you know, whereas if you have this health person who, just, who looks healthy and moves as such, 
Uh, if you go a little bit below, for example, if you go here, but you know, if you have the, uh, a corpse who has the exact shape, but it's not moving, then it's actually very scary to us. Or if you have a moving corpse, which is being called you know, like a, a, a zombie, then it's even scarier, right? So what we don't want is we want to basically remain in this region and, you know, then you know falling into this region actually you know is basically is not something that we prefer so we decide to do along these lines now in our case the industrial robots that we are interested in well they are, they already have bodies so i cannot change their look much uh, without basically degrading their functionality so what we want to do is uh, if i have my station robot along this line by moving or animating this okay uh, in a human-like way or using some human-robot interaction basically features, I want to uh, increase their affinity as much as possible without basically uh, decreasing their basic functionality. Now, towards this end, we studied a couple of things. Uh, of course, you know, the fact that any industrial acceptance uh, is, you know, it's, it's a very hard job. So these are just ideas. And so we started with the posture and gaze. So we kind of like you know, uh, try this uh, head on neck posture, which actually re resembles animals like a swan. And this is interesting because these robots are essential open chain manipulators. And uh, when you look at this, and uh, this is very, uh, it's, uh, they are very similar to animals because uh, as opposed to humans, which uh, where we manipulate uh, object with our hands, uh, animals manipulate objects with their heads. So this is actually, this arm is much like a snake or, you know, a, a swan, a duck or, or a, a dog and etc. So in this sense, basically, this, we try to have this head on neck posture. And then you can see that like with this, if we can actually create some gaze that's pointing towards the space. It can be a mutual or shared gaze. And when we'll, we'll, we'll use the gripper parallel towards the ground to give the illusion of a beak and added sunglasses to add some coolness uh, to its appeal. So the, I will discuss basically the first study that we have done, which was basically presented in 2020. Unfortunately, I was not able to go there. This is the conference took place just at the beginning of this um, of the pandemic. So if I had like if it was a week before, I would have been locked up in UK, you know, for at least uh, two months, I think. Uh, so we did an experiment in which basically we tried uh, basically three different uh, um, three different things. One is appeal. So we decided basically two different conditions, appeal off and appeal on. In the appeal off, this is more the regular way that they do. In the appeal on, we have this like, you know, the orientation is changing. And then we have this, uh, we, uh, the, we have the uh, sunglasses. Of course, these are completely dummy sunglasses, uh, but uh, we put by putting this, you know, it's very cheap. It's, it doesn't degrade its manipulation capabilities. So we try to keep the robot as simple as possible. And uh, here is basically how it would look. So this is the case where we appeal is off, okay? And you can see like, a, so this is, a, it has this uh, different orientation. Uh, and you know, let's go to this, this. And this is the case where we have the appeal on. So you can see that you know, it's, uh, at least to me, it, it, it looks much cooler. Okay, and then uh, I talked about the secondary behaviors that uh, people used in the second is the secondary behavior. We decided to use breathing, and then I will uh, come to this back later. But in our initial study, we just you know had this like uh, get this running, and then like you know complete the hand coded, and then did this study, and then decided to move this. So this is a case where the robot is basically moving with no secondary behavior. So it's just moving and mo standing still, okay? So this is the, uh, 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 this is the first condition. And the second, second condition, uh, it moves and uh, when it moves there, it's kind of uh, in, in course breathes. It makes this you know, oscillatory basically motions to basically uh, feel like it's breathing as a second behavior. It's completely useless, but as I said, this is just to increase its ability. And uh, then for the arcing, we again uh, did some studies. Like uh, the, in, in this case, we had this. This is the case where we had no arcing. 
it moves between different pauses in straight lines. Okay, and uh, when we turn the, the arcing on, then the, we, uh, we basically fit it a spline into this, and we can see that then it's much, much more smooth and uh, as such. So we studied basically this, basically uh, this uh, three factors uh, in a, a mixed factorial design where we had basically uh, this uh, user studies uh, where, we, where the users uh, essentially had to uh, um, screw nuts <clears throat> on, 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 a, on a piece of wood. So in the first group, we had the appeal off, in the second one, appeal on, and then we basically uh, tried different combinations of our arcing and breathing. And uh, basically, we have uh, this uh, between participant factor for, for uh, participant factor for appeal and within participant factors for breathing and arcing. And we did four trials per participant, such that you know we counter balanced ordering and uh, create out uh, of forty eight experiments. Now, uh, when we did basically uh, when the results came, it's interesting and the uh, breathing behavior. Uh, turned out to be the most, uh, sorry, after basically these experiments, we conducted two, uh, uh, two questionnaires to measure basically the human robot interaction called the gut speed and hearing at all. And uh, if you have questions, I, will, I can come back to this. But I would like to just jump into our results. Uh, for about these three factors, Breathing behavior was the most significant contributor to the HR quality, like you know, social presence or perceived intelligence. We could see basically a statistically significant increase uh, just through the including of inclusion of breathing behavior. Interesting, like the arcing behavior resulted in a mixed response across different basic constructs, such as trust, uh, you know, perceived intelligence and anonymity. And so, so this was a little bit uh, people, the, the subjects reported that you know, it moved very smoothly. Uh, they actually were a little bit scared about it because it was so smooth. And this may have to do with the fact that we also have, already have a robot concept and we expect robots to move in more straight lines like this instead of like very smooth. This may be due to this. And uh, what surprised us was that you know the appeal had no direct significant effects on any of the constructs. So this was very surprising to us. And because this was actually, I mean, at the beginning of this the whole design, we expected to have the most out of this. This surprised us. And uh, what we did was we uh, conducted a new baseline experiment, uh, and we thought that in this particular case, even when the appeal was off, we were still directing the gripper towards the human. And we were we suspected whether this would is the causes caused this, that you know, and uh, so we then looked at basically two things. We looked at the posture, which which we decided elbow up or elbow down configurations, and as well as the pointing and gazing behavior. So this is the case where like where we basically the robot is gazing towards basically where the uh, uh the human is supposed to screw uh, its nuts uh, along this uh, and, uh, and this is the case where the interface is off okay and this is where we have the posture on and this is where we have the posture off this is the basically the complete opposite to, uh, to the head on neck behavior and again we did the same kind of experiments uh with with interface and posture on and off Again, four trials per participant with uh, 24 experiments. And in this case, well, you know, like to our basically delight, we uh, realized that the gazing pointing has a significant effect on the enemies and social presence of the robot. So this kind of confirmed that, you know, the whole sunglass and the orientation of the beak, it had generated some extra things, but the pointing of this gripper was sufficient, was sufficient and strong that the other ones were just an add-on basically uh, factor. This was, and <clears throat> that the posture did not have a significant effect. Uh, again, you know, in this case, the number of uh, participants was very basically limited. Uh, after this, uh, we said, okay, all like uh, all that experiment was done with, you know, uh, kind of hand-coded behaviors. We said, you know, how can we make this actually uh, make this more uh, uh, automatic? For example, the gazing behavior. 
like uh, for gazing and breathing behavior, then we look at how we can implement them, like, you know, uh, to, uh, and then study them in detail. So the uh, UR5 has is, is a six DOF uh, robotic manipulator, and we treated the first three DOFs as the body and the last three, basically, joints as uh, the head. And we use the first three uh, to implement a breathing, whereas the last three as the head to, to implement pointing and gazing. And for the uh, for gazing, we actually use the last basically joints. And you know, if this is the uh, the red vector is the gazing uh, direction. We uh, treated to this point uh, the joint three as the start point of the gaze and joint four as the end point of the gaze, and we kind of then directed this to the point uh, of gaze that you have to do. And for this, basically what we did was that we compute the current case and the desired case using forward kinematics. We found the angle between them using the cosine theorem, and then use this as a cost function to minimize uh, and then find the next set of joints to gaze in the proper direction. And uh, then regarding the breathing, uh, well, well, if we uh, were again, like, you know, when we looked at the literature, uh, there were a lot of basically attempts towards using breathing, uh, studying breathing, and like in, in the case of this toy, or like, you know, especially with fur toys, it was like, you know, this breathing had a basically really, it was studied in by different people to express robots' emotions or internal states or affect humans station. And actually, you know, this uh, breathing, like even in the case of like, you know, uh, such a mechanical structure they use to study it and say, uh, show that basically it, uh, it's had positive effect as we have seen in our study. Now, uh, we studied basically how this uh, breathing was generated. And uh, in HRI, it was mostly People use generated uh, this uh, breathing uh, using mostly sinusoidal signals, uh, where you know with amplitude changes over time as such, and uh, or non-sinusoidal uh, signals uh, to express emotions and uh, but not making them uh, realistic. Uh, it's used actually with quite a lot in animation to, to have these characters to come to alive. And uh, people use you know, musculoskeletal models uh, or use some real data to basically have this minor basically changes in the human chest basically volume uh, and then incorporated them into animation. Uh, we used basically uh, the data. <clears throat> we, we try to see you know how does this uh, how the, how can this be mapped to our industrial robot, cobot, uh, and we looked at this volumetric flow rate uh, in time as a human breathes. We took its integral and then copied it the volume change. So this was our data for basically to generate the, uh, this. And we're well, then using this basically data, then we mapped this uh, into amplitude and frequency and generating uh, it's a breathing signal as such. And uh, the breathing signal, actually, there were like different, a couple of different, basically, uh, alternatives, which we tried. So this first one is the sinusoidal, uh, basically, generation. In this case, uh, you know, breathing is, it's kind of, uh, it's, I'm a little bit reluctant to use it as such, because uh, you know, breathing, the verb breathing is actually, uh, some people may argue that I'm just using some assolutory action, but this is basically, uh, needs further study whether we can call this breathing or not. So this is just sinusoidal data where we you can see that are these the first three joints are moving basically uh, with this signal. Now uh, then to implement the spring model, which is kind of like which generates this waveform, and in in this case you can see a slight difference. So it's more like a a spring that's basically uh, jumping up and down. It's a little bit sharp. And then here comes the real human data. And uh, these are pretty subtle, but you can see that like, you know, it's the, uh, I mean, if you see this, observe, uh, you can see that it's different. And it's, when you look at it, it, it may be 
uh, may uh, it it's, uh, looks different, but it's uh, uh, it actually uh, comes up in our studies. Let me see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next problem that we had was, you know, how does breathing uh, basically inter uh, interact with gazing? And uh, again, there are like a couple of different options. So one option is, you know, when we are like to breathing, we try to keep our gaze direction the same. This was basically one option. Another one is, if you have this space here, then as we basically move, the gaze basically looks at this point. Uh, at all the time. So this was basically the second option. And the third one is, you know, you don't uh, change the gaze and it moves uh, without, uh, based on the spreading. Okay, this, in this case, the vector is kept uh, constant, but it's moving along this line. Uh, okay, so uh, what we did was we basically, uh, focused on this basically uh, the where we have this we did is the direction vector and we decided uh, to use this human data and we did know that with, with, with the uh, 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 gaze not being basically adapted to for breathing and generating such data and uh, we studied uh, basically two different conditions uh, like although if we had this uh, generation of data to these uh, generation of data uh, and uh, also the gaze and breathing interaction, then there are too many, uh, basically, uh, uh, too many combinations which makes uh, it impossible to conduct studies. So we decided just to go with uh, human like data uh, and uh, no interaction between gaze and breathing and just focus on the amplitude and the frequency of breathing. So we uh, then uh, for this, we have a control condition where the, the breathing is human breathing with 20 breath per uh, BPM and smaller amplitude. We have a higher frequency which 40 BPM and a larger amplitude condition with 20 BPM. And we did again uh, the same thing that where we have <clears throat> these four patterns for different subjects and uh, basically to randomize the arguments. And we basically measure the test performance by completion time, test quality, uh, evaluating by the velocities and acceleration of the hand, uh, which are measured by a, a, a smartwatch. And then again, use the same uh, basically questionnaires uh, to uh, to evaluate the HR qual uh, basically quality. And you know, this is the again the general experiment flow where we you know. Brief or the ready condition trial one two three a uh, questionnaire and if they are done then we go and then uh, do this four times and then the experiment finishes. So in in this particular case uh, we were talking about the sequential collaboration where the robot task is basically hand him uh, and not is uh, uh, sorry a screw here and the and the uh, subject's task is then uh, takes take this and then you know uh, check whether it's uh, it screws into a knot basically uh, properly okay and so we did basically experiments and this is all done during the pandemic so it was a little bit difficult so we very basically uh, where I did these two variables and uh, did three measurements. And uh, when we analyze them, uh, we uh, basically uh, again get the same thing that breathing, but the breathing frequency similar to humans has a significant positive effect on task performance, whereas the amplitude had no effect. So this is basically what we have done. And uh, <clears throat> When we did this uh, paired sample t task on maximum span and absolute maximum of raw acceleration data, uh, we can see that uh, in, in the case of frequency experiment, we have an increase in the maximum span and the, uh, uh, again in the absolute maximum. And uh, unfortunately, you know, like we were not able to get very much uh, effect on the HRI quality, and we are still basically working on how to 
uh, you know, this is a task that, uh, like when you have the secondary behavior, what's difficult is, you know, this breathing is actually taking place on the robot when the robot, when the human is actually uh, basically doing its job, it's looking at somewhere else. So it's kind of like doing it the peripheral vision. And we kind of suspect that uh, this uh, this effect is uh, like having the secondary behavior studying it is, is more difficult than we had anticipated. So we will uh, try it basically different experiments <coughs> where the human's attention uh, is geared towards uh, actual, uh, towards uh, the um, uh, robot's breathing. So let me skip this. And we are also at this time actually uh, after developing these two behaviors, it is some interactive demo and I'd like to take the broad bullet for this. So this is basically how it looks, like so it's breathing along with this. Uh, so at this time it's just breathing. And now you can see basically how basically it is following this uh, you know, marker, okay. This is, it's very responsive. So it's we, we have coupled this with breathing. And see this. Okay. Uh, Errol, and, I, I missed yes. something like how does breathing affects the task performance? Like you mentioned some task performance, like mm -hmm. how do you measure that? Like, oh, we, we looked at uh, how fast, uh, uh, we looked at how fast uh, they screwed up, uh, they completed this, uh, uh screwing, they had to screw, I think, four uh screws and how fast they did uh -huh. okay. okay sorry for the interruption yeah. uh no no it's fine and this is like you know when you put the marker on a camera so this is you know if you are in the experiment this is how you would feel again initially it's just breathing it's not looking at you and then, then we turn on the gaze Okay, and after the gaze is turned on, then it's it just follows you as such. And if your movement's fast, then it moves fast, and so on. Okay, so this is basically how how the robot looks. And now we can do this in real time. Okay, in real time. Okay, now I'd like to discuss basically a second study, which is actually being presented at IROS at this time. This was presented like two days ago in Kyoto. And let me just you know, move ahead by Özgür Aslan. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we were interested in basically how we can learn assembly. Uh, and if you have ever, uh, if you have ever taken an IKEA basically, uh, or something like a Lego, uh, there are these instructions on how to assemble it, right? And you have like step one, step two, et cetera, et cetera. You have to find the correct part and you have to put the, the proper assembly. This is how we are supposed to do. But especially with the uh, with most things, you kind of look at the final finished product. And then that gives you quite a lot where, where things should go. This is done with the, uh, And after that, you kind of follow the, with the assembly instructions kind of loosely, but you, you need to get this. So in, in this study, we uh, basically uh, tried, you know, learning assembling models from the point cloud. So we had this final product as a point cloud. And then we have the point, the point cloud of these different parts, okay? Uh, as well as the partial product, which means that, you know, and then as we move on, we treat it as, as a reinforcement learning, basically, problem then uh, as we try basically installing them in this simulation then we get a reward and then we do an in a direction and so on and uh, for this basically in, in this study we studied how we can use these point clouds of the parts as well as the well, the completed basically furniture uh, and uh, use this to guide uh, to learn this assembly with the sequence. And in doing this, we calculated the reward measures basically using two basically different uh, reward functions. One is about incomplete this and the other one is incorrect this, <clears throat> which I will tell in a second. Okay, so here's again the general idea that we have a partial assembly uh, and then we have an action and then you know, after an action, we have a, oh, I'm sorry, this is okay. okay. So this is basically, uh, we have a, 
action and then we have this uh, final target cloud and we uh, basically uh, convert this i'm sorry this is okay so we we had prepared these slides uh, to generate this video and so this is why it's kind of skipping between these different slides which i didn't uh, realize so in this case we look at uh, uh, compare the partial basically the partial uh, point clouds partially assembled uh, furniture with the target one and then get a reward for this and uh, for this we basically took for each uh, uh, part they uh, have their point clouds and then generated basically use use them as uh, we express them with a with a graph and with this graph okay which you have like the red one is the point and the uh green ones are, are the say uh, are the are the uh, connection points then we took them and then we passed the point cloud through a point net and generated basically the, the models uh to represent the graph okay where we have we can have connections between two different uh like uh, here's one part and then uh then uh, we can have this uh, connection the uh, the connection between these two are being formed as such. So in, uh, that uh, the partially assembled, uh, uh, the partially assembled uh, uh, part is uh, represented like that. So after this, then the, the uh, uh, graph, uh, this representation has gone through this. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, this three. Levels. Okay, some problems here. Okay, let me see here. Okay. Okay. And it's, it goes through three convolution layers and then, then the multi layer perceptron. And after this, then you know, we generate the partially uh, assembled product and compare this with the target point cloud. And then after that, then we get a reward. Now for the reward, as I said, we basically two two different uh, 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 reward functions. One is about incompleteness, how incomplete the system is. Okay, the other one is incorrect, this meaning that you know in the incompleteness we measure basically the difference between the from the target to the from the partial. In the incorrectness, we measure the you know, whether any incorrect uh, assembling were made. So that's basically that's the partial assembly. And uh, then here we have this target that is moving as such. And then we register them with ICP and then calculate these measures. Okay, let me just skip them a bit, I'm running. So here's the incorrect measure. And with this, uh, basically through a simulation, we were able to uh, study to the uh, different IKEA is the uh, assist, uh, uh, different uh, <clears throat> IKEA uh, products, and then basically which consists to like a few parts like this, like chairs and some tables. Uh, and for each of these parts, we had devised those connection signs, and then see how we can basically complete them. It and it, this is actually you know learning wise. This is better than the state of art. It's not complete and good enough yet, but uh, the idea that we can have these three different ones, uh, two different uh, reward functions actually benefit. So basically with the, as such, uh, we have this weak distribution uh, with two novel measures so with incompleteness and incorrectness. And uh, we also have basically discussed that you know, this all thing can be improved by using a meta RL, okay, uh, for one agent to work with all the different furniture models that, and to generalize on scene furnitures and adding some physics based uh, uh, graph representations. Now, with that, um, I would like to just, as I promised, to discuss, show you about what uh, the center that I'm talking about, Roma, is. Uh, it was founded in 2019 with funding from Strategy and Bichabash Kandler, and then uh, basically became an official center at the beginning of 2001. And these are the different basically spaces that we have created. Uh, this is where we do, you know, uh, with uh, uh, this cult of project uh, where we work with many platers, both uh, on like you know, on physical uh, mobile club mounted on mobile robot platforms or fixed onto basically some setups. 
and we have built uh, a mechatronics workshop. And this is kind of the clean way that it's actually way crowded and packed up with a lot of tools to prototype basically different things. And this is very worked with uh, 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 leg robots and as well as uh, rehabilitation robots, exoskeletons and such. And we have uh, a, a Vicon motion capture system uh, in which we can run uh, like, you know, swarm studies where we have uh, like the small drones, or we can also conduct uh, uh, experiments where we needed some ground truth for some robotic systems. And uh, as part of this center, uh, we also have this uh, in, uh, interdisciplinary graduate program, which opened up at the beginning of the, this year. And we have actually started to get basically multiple uh, students from different uh, undergraduates. And the only that the problem is, well, well, the students in these programs uh, can get uh, from a wide variety of uh, cor uh, courses um, offered by computer science, mechanical, electric uh, engineering, as well as aerial engineering. And then they need to have a advisor and advisor from the different departments and support uh, and are required to spend at least half of their half of their week at Matthew. And we also have an internship programs for undergraduate, which we started this year. Uh, so we can uh, and last year, but this year out of 300 applicants, we were able to host uh, like 20, 25 of them. Then they were involved in some of these projects. And you know, again, similar to this, we have some Romar talks, which uh, uh, I suggest you also follow me to Romar. Uh, and then, you know, if you're interested in such talks. And with that, I would like to thank you. And these are my collaborators who have contributed much to our work. And with that, uh, I would like to conclude my uh, basically presentation and I can take uh, any questions that you may have. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Erol. Uh, I like the idea that like co-advisors from two different departments, I think it makes the project highly interdisciplinary, which is great, I think. Uh -huh. uh, so maybe some questions like from the audience. Uh, I I actually have a very quick question. So how did you uh -huh. choose like those uh, uh, adjectives in uh, uh, you know measuring the uh, uh, you know humans' response to the robot? Like you uh -huh. mentioned that likeness, intimacy, and like is there uh -huh. a, like a clear literature on this topic like uh, what are the major adjectives to use uh, uh, -huh. uh yes actually i mean there are like a uh, preparing such such a uh, questionnaire is actually a complete study by itself maybe i can see if i can show it here so like uh, you cannot come up with your own constructs you can you have to basically uh rely on someone who has done this and so you can share my screen here are those adjectives well defined like it is accepted by oh like turkish versions available as well that's great okay <laughs> yes and that's 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 what we did but you know uh the, the for example uh let's see here so all these things that they have done, conducted studies, and uh, basically, uh, and we just took them and uh, applied them. They have done, you know, uh, mm -hmm. there are many other things, like you see, there's, okay, there's, this is Botmax, and this is, uh, that's, it's just called the, uh, and then this is Herring mm -hmm. Toolkit for Measuring Acceptance, uh, Anxiety, Attitude, and so on. In pursuit adaptability and then we just you just apply them and then if you get some statistically significant results then you say okay bingo i have it okay i still don't understand like you mentioned it but i still don't understand how you measure the performance because i don't think that you're doing maybe i mean i'm misunderstanding but you're not like i mean robot and human are not performing the task together that you can uh -huh. measure the task performance isn't that uh, right like oh uh, so with the for second the task performance like that part i am uh -huh. still confused so i think you show a video where the uh like robot breathes like it follows certain pattern and then 
-huh. yes, this is the one. So Perfect. how, like, I still don't understand how you measure the task performance in here. Like, why would the breathing of a robot positively affects the uh, task performance of the user? What is the reason behind it? Uh, what is the reason? Uh, like, you know, basically, uh, running hypothesis was the following. If we didn't get the basically uh, result that we were expecting, so which kind of needs further investigation, uh, we thought that if the robot would breathe faster, it would make you basically perform, try to perform the task faster. Because, you know, when somebody's in a hurry, that, you know, you also try to do things fast, right? Mm -hmm. And that, so that's that that was our thing, which didn't okay. actually happen. And in this case, we measured this basically the task thing as you know the human. You know, this is run as a wizard of Oz method, where you know, there's this you know experimenter which is behind the scenes, and he observes. And when the human is done, then the, he instructs the robot to go ahead and give him another <laughs> with the screw. Uh, so the, the the speed that the human basically screws. Uh, like these uh, uh, screws them into the nuts. Basically, that's that's the measure of performance. How fast he does things. No. Now I understand. I think you're saying like if somebody breathes faster, then you are expecting that the other person will uh -huh. do the task faster, kind of thing. Okay. Right, I and mean, that's basically um, like as I said, in, in, we 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 will again be doing this experiment once more because I'm not happy with the uh, that I don't think that we were able to do it well. This is kind of like you try to do once and then you know, if it doesn't work, you know maybe we are doing something wrong in a different setup. We'll try again. And one of the things that we were not uh, happy is that you know we conduct them in a cubicle like environment. And now I'm kind of like uh, with, the, uh, with the new spaces that we get, I'm try, trying to have this human locked up into a room where he is supposed to feel the presence of this robot and then basically see how it affects. Maybe he will stand there and then basically sit there and then wait and see it's observing, it's, it's breathing and so on without doing anything else. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to do. But the, the main problem with secondary behavior is that you want to direct the attention of the human to something else, okay? Because he's supposed to do this with, you know, peripherally. It's not like he's, he should, you should, cannot say him, you know, observe this, are you happy or not? This is not how it works. And this is, that's that's much trickier than we had thought. So are they instructed the subjects, are they instructed about uh, this kind of behaviors of the robot? Or do they know that the robot is going to show some type of breathing behavior? I mean, no, uh, no, we don't. We, we just tell them about the task. Okay. That's the key thing. We just tell them what, what they're supposed to do. And there is this initial warm-up session where they do things. And then after that, you know, the breathing just comes in the background. Okay. All right. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question? Okay. Sure. Um, um, so did you ever consider attaching, I don't know, some verbal skills to these cobots, collaborating robots, because, you know, thinking that this verbal communication is one of the main uh, uh -huh. things between humans and, and in your case, since uh, you know, these cobots are expected to be more humanly communicating with the human so that, you know, uh, uh -huh. To engage them, maybe so. Can language be a part of it? Of course, of course. Like I have, like you know, of course, like studying someone as like a nonverbal behaviors. Like mm -hmm. my first thing to kill your body is that you know, in factories, it's very noisy. Okay, you you kind of just you know gesture things, and you see the mm -hmm. worker like it's very hard to talk. Uh, mm -hmm. And in this case, I don't think it will. Oh, but the other thing, oh, so that this is what my, this would be my argument to kill, basically. But uh, of course, yes, it's just that you know we have so, so many, many things at our hand that when you try to put in any kind of language model, then the whole ball game just explodes. So even with this, like you know, this you know breathing, we have like you know six different factors, and you know if you want to come up with any kind of statistical significant uh, result from these user studies then the, you, you're you supposed to experiment with, I don't know, like 500 basically yeah. people, which is just crazy. It's not possible. So that's just... Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
yeah, it's not yeah, it's not easy to implement and justify. I see that also with this appeal thing with these glasses that you tried. So mm -hmm. you with the experiment you saw that doesn't really affect has an impact or positive impact on the on the user, but maybe the appeal could be you know implemented in many many different ways and yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit uh, yeah. Right. It's not. It's not like a, like a, like one of the things that I'm really happy is you know uh, as you know I also have an eye cup in my lab which is kind of sitting still. It's it's way too complicated to do things. Whereas the nice thing about the system is that you know I can have this guy run twenty four seven. Okay, these are industry robots. They are you know, mm -hmm. robust, so I don't have to just like you know like. Uh, for in terms of reliability it's a really good platform like whatever all i have to do is just run it and that's basically that's the so i can have now run you know long-term interactions with these guys of course like designing them is of course like that's an art and like you need to be very careful in that but language models and other things it's also fine they're kind of building this whole system uh where we have to have this you know gazing you know breathing such that you know when you get in then you can you should feel it of course like you know speech and in you know, other verbal communication or other things they're also possible uh and uh, they are worth basically thing it's just that we're getting off the ground uh with these basic studies uh to say that this kind of like is interesting thank you thank you thank you for the talk you're welcome Thank you for the talk, Ajam. Uh, <clears throat> very, very quick question in the interest of time. <laughs> uh, this about the uh, furniture project. Which uh, environment did you use? Did you use the IKEA furniture assembly environment that, uh, like, yes, one with Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, we, we use that. We use that. It, it, it has some basically technical problems, but uh, this time it was easier. We're also extending that environment uh, to other simulations. I use some motion planner and other things. Uh, I think my students know better than myself. Unfortunately, they're not here. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Maybe we can take one more question. And then... uh, I have one. Yes. Can I ask? Yeah. Um, about the first project, uh, like, uh, first of all, like, how did you choose these, like, principles, or we can call it cues? I mean, breathing or gazing or something. Uh, how did you choose them? And can you add, like, more, maybe, for example, hand checking in the beginning, something like this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sarah. Uh, yes, uh, of course, like, you know, when you design these things, it's it's interesting that, you know, we first, you know, they had this gut feeling that, you know, this would work, this, and then so that this is like at the beginning of the scenario, it was all like, you know, let's, I think it will work, okay? And in terms of the, the principle, there are uh, like a 12 of them. Like, so it means that we have more. Some of them are relevant, some of them are not relevant because they were accustomed towards drawing things, okay? But there are a lot of things, and this is actually related with acting, for example. I don't know, uh, like, you know, if you want to pick something else, what you do is you first uh, gaze at it and then look at it and then the, try grasping that. So we also did this. Uh, there are a lot of, many of them, it's, it's uh, but not all of them are very easy. And also in terms of basically human road interaction studies, it's difficult to uh, basically, you know, when you add more, well, okay, robot, robotics wise, it's easy. We have done this, but when it comes to, basically conducting studies and then try to get some, you know, statistical results, then it becomes a completely different ball game. Uh, so we decided to kind of like stop at this point and then kind of uh, try to get more statistical significant results. But, you know, the, the book is available and there are a lot of actual videos uh, which kind of discuss what those animation principles are in very neat terms. Uh, but applying them to robotics, it takes some basically <clears throat> it takes some uh, thinking, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. Um, and all are scripted, right? Like those movements are scripted. Like uh, how can you add them if the, maybe the robot is doing something autonomous or, I mean, will it affect the robot's operation? 
that 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 is correct. Like in our case, what we did was, um, uh, you know, we are talking about industrial settings. So it means that you cannot add something that's fancy. For example, the breathing behavior. We said that you know this is yes, this is completely useless. But uh, you know, if the robot is working with a worker. And you know, it, if there are times that he's not basically the, the the robot is not doing anything instead of standing still, just having it move it may actually be you know beneficial for the social interaction. So that's why you know we we need to use these idle times to do things. And despite this kind of promise, there's I think it's a long way. Like I have talked with some you know uh, guys who are responsible for. Uh, factory automation or actually using them and you know they they have you know it's it's not as um i mean like getting something into the uh, uh like you know they're hesitant about a lot of these issues and they're right about it like the head on next posture for example they for example argue that this kind of limits the space and uh, so you have to be very careful on what they include and what not to include mm -hmm. right yeah Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, Erol, thank you very much again for your talk and accepting mm -hmm. our invitation. And uh, we wish you uh, success in your studies, future studies. And uh, again, thank you for making the presentation. Have a nice day. Uh, okay, you're, you're welcome. And I look forward to your talk as well. Thank you. 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 Thank you.